My name is Katherine Skinner. I'm the Executive Director of the Educopia Institute, which is a 501c3 that was founded in 2006 to catalyze and host networks and collaborative communities. Among our other projects and programs, we currently serve as the host for the Library Publishing Coalition Project, which is the two-year initiative that involves 60 research libraries that really has brought us here today. They're engaged in the founding of a new network and a new community right now, as most of you know. The LPC project, as we've come to call it, is fundamentally a community effort. And in July 2013, it began when three universities came together with Educopia Institute to explore the possibility of launching a new organization that could bridge the libraries that are engaging in publishing activities and do so across a lot of different types of models, ranges of uh, behaviors and you know, experiments that are going on across the field. We weren't interested in just one flavor, and we also weren't interested in having three institutions, which were the ones that, uh, that came to Educopia with this idea, take the lead and found the organization for the community. Instead, what we wanted to do was actively engage the community in the founding of the organization. So we did what I've called a grand experiment ever since. We threw the doors open and we said, we think that there's a need for a coalition around library publishing. We think that there is enough activity in this area that it warrants closer study and that it warrants the building of a network and a community. So come along with us if you're interested and let's see what we can do together. And we laid out deliverables for the project, we laid out a basic game plan, and literally just sent it out to the community and said, if you're interested, please join us and seed fund the project. Well, we had 60 institutions step forward to do just that. And as part of our arrangement with those institutions, what we wanted to do, again, is not have those three institutions, or Educopia, um, start to define the parameters of this organization, or the governance, or lay down any of the kind of uh, framework for where we were going. Instead, we've involved the community in every step of that process. Now, that means that it takes a little bit longer than if somebody had just sat down and written it down. You know that anything collaborative takes a little bit longer. But it also means that I think the eventual Library Publishing Coalition, which will officially launch later this year, will be very, very strong as a community from its onset. Uh, the other thing that I'll mark is that we have lots of strategic affiliates that are uh, colleagues and collaborators with library publishers. And from the beginning, we've had a vested interest in making sure that we're building relationships and building bridges across the different communities that interact in the scholarly publishing world. So that project is really where this forum begins. Uh, even though this forum is larger than that project. So many of you in the room are not part of that project. That's great. We're gra glad to see you, and we hope eventually you might even become members of the Library Publishing Coalition. Uh, but the forum is a space where we can gather people across communities to exchange ideas and talk about the things that are relevant to the uh, scholarly communication cycle today. So I know that many of you, like us, had to undertake some rather adventurous journeys to get here. Uh, I want to say I appreciate your perseverance in making it for those of you who did have travel challenges, and we promise that we'll make it worth all of our while. I want to start by thanking those 60 institutions that have made this possible. Um, they have contributed both the seed funding and the people power to enable the Library Publishing Coalition project to move forward, and I'd appreciate it if you guys would stand and be recognized for a moment. So if you represent a founding or contributing institution, please stand. Mm. It's a really wonderful effort, and I will say that most of those who stood up have not just come to this event. They have also been contributing through subgroups, working groups, uh, and being a part of the life of the project. So we greatly appreciate all of the effort. I also want to thank our generous sponsors, B Press, uh, Bookmasters, Bibliolabs, uh, Public Knowledge Project, Easy ID, and AAUP. If you can all also stand and be recognized. That generous sponsorship goes a long way. So thank you for helping to make this a reality. And then finally, I want to thank the amazing folks who have served on the program committee. As you'll soon see, they have served this community well in putting together a dynamic and interactive program that's sure to lay a solid foundation for future forums that we'll host in the years to come. So Bob uh, Sarah Bobain, Dan Lee, Sarah Lippincott, uh, Mark Newton, Melanie Schlosser, Marsha Stockholm, 
Allegra Swift, and Aviva Weinrub, thank you so much for all of the help that you've given. And if all of you can also stand for just a moment and be recognized. <laughs> Those are the people you go and find if you can't find Sarah and me and something is going wrong. Now on that note, I know that the internet is already going wrong. I also know that that happened to Spark. So it's not just our conference, I think it's something uh, with the way that the hotel has it set up. So I deeply apologize for any inconvenience that people face and know that we will do everything in our power to try to fix it. But those of you who have hosted events know that this is always tricky and it's always at the will of the facility rather than at the will of the host. So again, my deep apologies, we'll do everything we can. I will say that those of you who have not already heard me say this, we also sent out the wrong password. Uh, our apologies, they gave us the wrong password, we gave you the wrong password. It should have been a capital E on Educopia, and it's Educopia123. So we'll announce that multiple times. We've also, I think, tweeted it out at this point. Um, so if you're on Twitter, you can see it, but sometimes it's hard to get on Twitter if you can't get on the internet. So in any case, we will, we will try to make sure that we continue to announce that over the course of uh, the time that we're here. We will man the registration desk to the best of our abilities. I will be out there for a good portion of this, but as you can imagine, I'm delighted to be here and I wanna hear all the speakers too. So if I leave the registration desk, know that I will leave my phone number at the registration desk. You can text me or call me at any point if something has gone awry and you need us, or you can call on any of those program uh, committee members that you just saw. And quick logistics, bathrooms. I was told that they are around the corner. I haven't gone to find this out yet, but they're evidently around the corner from the elevator. And I was told if you just walk around, you'll find them. So if you just walk around, you'll find them. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, and then do note that we'll be hosting a reception and poster session tonight from 6 o'clock until 8 o'clock this evening. We hope you'll all join us for that. It'll be a lot of fun. Um, also note, if you are a poster bearer, uh, hopefully we already have your poster. If we don't, then please uh, do bring that down and come to the registration desk and we'll take care of it. And then all of those of you who do have posters and are going to be part of the poster session, please meet us at the very beginning of this first break in the little lobby area that's off to the left as we come into the room. Um, we just want to talk to you about the poster setup. We've got a lot of posters and we want to make sure everybody's happy with the way that those are set up. Um, also note that in your folders there are a lot of items of relevance, including a call for submissions to a forthcoming publication that's based around the ideas exchanged here at this forum. It's not just for presenters, it's for anybody who's participating, because as you'll see, this is designed to be a very participatory event. We expect all of you to be engaged in the conversations that we're going to have over the next day and a half. And finally, there's also a flyer in there uh, regarding the Library Publishing Coalition project that'll give you a little bit more background on the project if you're not familiar with it, and uh, also give you contact information if you want more information than is there. Finally, attendee lists, I've already been asked several times, know that those will be sent out by email. We think it's more effective to do that than to have the printed version, and then you guys can print them if you'd like to. So hopefully that doesn't offend anybody's sensibilities, and we will have those out to you guys. And we'll try to do that actually today so that you can see who among your colleagues are uh, at this event. We have quite a program in store, starting with brief introductory remarks from the Library Publishing Coalition's awesome program manager, Sarah Lippincott. And I just want to thank you all for joining us today. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Many of you know my voice, and most of you have seen my name in your email before. I'm Sarah Lippincott, Program Manager for the Library Publishing Coalition. And I'm very pleased to open this event, um, which promises to be an enriching experience for all of you here, representing libraries, university presses, scholars, and, pub and other publishers. Um, this field has a lot to be proud of, and this project has a lot to be proud of over the past year. I just wanted to mention a couple of the, the highlights from the li Library Publishing Coalition project. Uh, foremost among them, this gathering here. We have an amazing turnout for this event. It really speaks to the, the interest uh, and uh, momentum in this field. Um, and the other, our library publishing directory, uh, which has been downloaded over 500 times um, since its publication last October. Um, it's, uh, it's just a wonderful uh, uh, showcase of all of the activities that are going ac on across this field. 
So this event um, is a little bit different from others in the field. The program committee wanted to prompt discussion, uh, sharing, and conversation, and the day and a half ahead was carefully designed to foster and provoke exactly that. And our theme of alignment really underscores the need for this community to think about the ways in which its activities are meeting the needs of its stakeholders, scholars, students, other publishers, their broader campus communities, and the library field. Instead of spotlighting separate presentations, we're hosting panels in which some of the most creative and accomplished leaders of our field will engage with each other in conversations about some of the most important topics of interest to the scholarly publishing community today. These panelists represent a range of viewpoints and communities, including those of librarians, scholars, scholars publishers, and service providers. Each panel will be followed by three simultaneous breakout sessions, and I hope the only frustration you'll feel while you're here is that you can't be a part of all three at once. Um, the breakout sessions provide an opportunity for all of you, um, our participants, to become more than an audience. The breakouts will seek to engage each of your voices and the expertise each of you brings in, discussion, uh, in discussing the critical issues our presenters will be raising. To that end, please note that the three rooms are intentionally capped at around 60 participants each. If there are sessions you feel particularly moved to attend, I encourage you to grab a seat early in those sessions. And those sessions take place on the pavilion level, which is accessible via the escalators in the foyer. Also, we've left ample time for the networking activities that we know all of you are looking forward to during breaks, meals, and the reception this evening. Fostering and deepening connections in the library publishing community and between library publishers and their many allies in the scholarly publishing field is a key goal of this event. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our opening keynote speaker, John Unsworth. In February of 2012, John was appointed Vice Provost for Library and Technology Services and Chief Information Officer at Brandeis University, where he is also University Librarian and Professor of English. In August 2013, he was appointed by President Obama to serve on the National Humanities Council. Before coming to Brandeis, he was Dean of the Graduate School of Library and Information Science at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign from 2003 to 2012. In addition to being a professor at GSLIS at Illinois, he also held appointments in the Department of English and on the library faculty. John is a pioneer in the field of digital humanities, and his work situates him at the intersection of scholarship and the libraries. And for this reason, we are really delighted that he is here with us today. Come on up, John. <laughs> Morning. Some of you will recognize the reference. Um, my life seems to have 10 year periods to it. Um, I'm looking back in this talk to a talk that I gave in 2005, in December of 2005, at a meeting of the Society for Scholarly Publishing in Boston, uh, which I will come to in a minute. But as I was sitting, thinking before I, I got up, there's another 10-year period before that. And actually, I would say my interest and my involvement in the subject of library publishing and uh, the many things that it can mean began in around 1995 and at that point I was the director of the Institute for Advanced Technology in the Humanities. I had started there in 1993 when they hired me by mistake um, and I was working with the Rossetti Archive uh, and negotiating with Eve Traeger and some other people at the University of Michigan Press to make the Rossetti Archive uh, one of the University of Michigan Press's first electronic publications. That was a long negotiation. Uh, it did not issue in a publication. Uh, the experience was um, 
tutelary, to say the least. And uh, I maintained an interest uh, from that time forward in trying to figure out the proper relationships and collaboration for librarians, scholars, and publishers, especially around new forms of born digital scholarship. Um, so I'll be talking about some of those topics today, nearly uh, 20 years later, and um, hopefully a little bit of wisdom will have accrued in the interval. Had a much better opening slide for the last uh, time I talked about this. Um, and I not only invented one, but two new professions. Um, interestingly, libelisher hasn't caught on. <laughs> Nobody wants to be one of those. Um, so pubrarians it is. Um, and I do think some of the things that we have to negotiate in this territory have to do with professional identity and uh, how we think of ourselves in our professions. Um, this has intersected for me just recently uh, in the classroom as well with some teaching I'm doing. Uh, yesterday and tomorrow I have taught, will teach uh, a course at Brandeis in the English department on 20th century American bestsellers. And in this course, at the moment, we're reading Babbitt, which I recommend if you haven't read it lately. Many of us haven't read it since high school. Um, it's actually a very good book, and one of the things that Babbitt talks about is the rise of the professional class in America. And it's very interesting on that subject. So I'll come back to that in just a slide, but uh, this is one marker, December 2005. Uh, in, this, in this talk on pubrarians and libelishers, there were uh, a number of points made, but um, principally I was noting the increasing overlap at that point in the activities of academic publishers and research libraries. And I was uh, calling at the end of the talk for the intentional development of some cross-trained professionals who would have education and experience in both professions, librarianship and publishing. Um, library publishing, according to the LPC website, uh, is based on core library values and building on the traditional skills of librarians is distinguished from other publishing fields by a preference for open access dissemination and a willingness to embrace informal and experimental forms of scholarly communication and to challenge the status quo. That's a, not just a mission statement, uh, that's also a, a statement of professional values and aspirations. And as I was looking at that and looking at some of the reading that we were discussing in class yesterday, uh, I was struck by this passage in an article that we were reading from an MLA publication. Uh, this is an article about Babbitt, Main Street, Aerosmith, Dodsworth, um, a set of novels in which Lewis really explores the rise of the professional managerial class. And uh, the author, Michael Augsburger, uh, who wrote this as part of his dissertation and had it published by Cornell University Press, um, has some very interesting things to say about this. The true professional ideal, he says, encouraged doctors, lawyers, engineers, scientists, ministers, and professors to approach their jobs as callings that demanded disinterested objectivity, a devotion to public service, professional autonomy, and a rejection of material ambition. And that's an interesting set of values for, uh, to, to take as defining characteristics of uh, the professional ideal. Elsewhere in this article, uh, Augsburger talks about um, a split in the professional class uh, and a bifurcation into what he calls adversarial professionals and uh, professionals who accommodate themselves to bureaucracy and to capitalism. And I think one of the challenges that we have in the library publishing world is actually that split. That um, we have two groups of professionals in the room. Uh, one of them 
is perforce uh, accustomed to interacting with marketplaces, uh, to dealing with money, uh, and to selling things. Uh, the other does not have that as part of their job description and feels vaguely queasy about all that stuff. And I think that's one of the humps that we have to get over in order to work together effectively. We have to recognize um, that really, if you're in academic publishing, you have a fair claim to have rejected material ambition. <laughs> OK? I mean, really. Uh, that, having accepted that, I think some of the other things might be easier to see that um, publishers like librarians uh, consider their work in the service of the public. Um, not only are they not doing it to get rich, they're doing it because they think it's a good thing to do. And in fact, if somebody hadn't, against all odds, published that dissertation uh, as a book, I wouldn't have found that very interesting article uh, that really illuminated a whole book and in some ways is you know, becoming a centerpiece for the class that I'm teaching. Um, so I think we have more of these professional values in common than we generally allow. Flash forward um, from December 2005 or January 1995, pick your starting point, to February 2014, uh, and against the grain original, University Press is facing enormous tectonic shifts in publishing. This has also been a theme for the last 20 years or so of my life <laughs> in, in uh, academia. There's a crisis in the humanities, there's a crisis in scholarly publishing, there's a crisis in the university. The only strange thing about this crisis is that it doesn't go away. <laughs> it never concludes. Usually there's some point at which a crisis is over. Um, this crisis seems to have become our mode of being. Um, this is actually a really nice roundup, this article, uh, by Nancy Herther from the University of Minnesota Libraries. Uh, a nice roundup of uh, up to the moment uh, perspectives, uh, some from uh, Sarah Lippincott and others involved with the Library Publishing Coalition, others from, like Doug Armato from the University Press World, and um, Sandy Thatcher. Um, there's some Good voices, some very interesting perspectives in this, and it's, uh, it's a nice compilation of markers of the current moment. Um, one of the things that we learn in the, in the piece is that uh, there are now more than 20 presses who are reporting through their libraries or as part of their libraries, and that 60 libraries now belong to the Library Publishing Coalition. So Brandeis belongs to both of those categories. Uh, Brandeis is a contributing member of the Library Publishing Coalition. And as of last spring, the Brandeis University Press, which had reported through the president's office, uh, is now reporting through the library. Um, the story of that change is instructive. Uh, I got a call from one of my uh, more senior senior managers uh, in the president's office who said, this press, do we need it? And I said, I said um, give it to me. <laughs> and you won't have to worry about it. I'll take care of it. Um, the Brandeis University Press is, in my view, an incredibly important part of the Brandeis brand out there in the world. Uh, it defines us uh, in some scholarly circles. And it's also part of the critical research infrastructure for the humanities and for the social sciences uh, at Brandeis. It's unusual in university presses in the way that it's grounded on the campus. Uh, it is integrated. Series editors come from centers and institutes on the campus in many cases. And so it's more connected to campus life and activity 
than university presses sometimes are. Um, I take that as a good sign, and it's one of the reasons that I wanted to adopt the press, because I think one of the challenges that university presses have is that their activity is essentially altruistic um, from the point of view of the university and the funders. It's easy to see why you would give a library money and not expect them to give you money back. Um, you give the library money because they procure collections uh, and resources which are used by your local constituency. Um, it's not at all clear in the same way that university presses provide a local good and therefore the logic of subsidy is more difficult. Um, one of the things that I am hopeful for in the Library Publishing Coalition is that we can change that calculus as more presses and more libraries start to work together that there will be seen to be local goods uh, that are not just forms of vanity publishing uh, that accrue to the campus as a result of having a press. So I'm hopeful, but we haven't quite figured it out. Um, libraries, having been subsidized to produce a local good, don't want to charge people for information. That seems like double dipping somehow. Um, university presses, who honestly believe in the value of the content that they're producing don't want to think that people might pay for the format in which that content is delivered. And that's not just university press publishers. I've, I think that's true of publishers everywhere, that it's a little bit of an insult to think that, you know, if somebody could get the intellectual content of the thing for free, that they would pony up, you know, nine dollars for an ebook format just because they like reading on their Kindle. Um, but in fact, that's how people behave. And nobody in this picture is fully funded for innovation, uh, much less for altruism. So we need to uh, grapple with those issues. Um, there's a, a saying attributed uh, to Einstein uh, and probably to a lot of other people. <laughs> it's one of those <laughs> sayings that you know, not everything you can count measures, uh, not, not everything that counts uh, can be measured, and not everything you can count uh, matters. Um, with respect to uh, the Library Press Coalition, it began um, by focusing on the libraries, and, and even in cases where there were presses reporting through those libraries, kind of taking those presses off the table in the initial headcount. Um, I asked about this. Uh, the reason given uh, for excluding them was reasonable, I think, uh, to enable direct comparison across library publishing programs, including those who do not work with the university press, and because the press often operates independently in terms of acquisitions, production, et cetera, from other library publishing activities, even if it's housed within the library. Um, all true. Um, very reasonable, I think, to want to compare apples to apples especially in the early stages of uh, defining a new kind of activity and disseminating best practices, et cetera. But um, I'm happy to see many publishers here and I'm happy that you know, subsequent conversations with people at the Library Publishing Coalition have made it clear that um, library publishing can also be uh, an activity seen to include uh, those university presses uh, that report up through libraries. Um, this is from Sarah Lippincott in the uh, Against the Grain article. Monograph publishing has been a fruitful area for collaboration between libraries and university presses. In one collaborative model, the press contributes editorial expertise and distribution me mechanisms for print, media, that and ebook is my rubricated insertion, um, while the library provides sophisticated technology for digital versions of the monograph or supplemental material. I think it's telling that in, in much of the stuff that the Library Publishing Coalition puts out and says about publishers, they are defined in some ways uh, as an earlier version of themselves. They do print. Uh, they're not interested in open access, and um, 
they do uh, distribution mechanisms and things like that. I think there's a, a lot that library publishers can uh, gain from working with university press publishers, and I'm going to talk about some of that. But I think it's critical to, to recognize uh, that university press publishers are no longer just about print, uh, far from it, uh, and that um, university press publishers are also no longer uh, opposed in some categorical way to open access. Like the rest of us, I think uh, they're trying to figure out how to make this work. So I think there's good value in sharing experience with other people who are starting to do something that you're starting to do. But I think ultimately, as a community, and as a community that includes both libraries and university presses, that we want to, at some point, step back far enough to measure and value the activity, regardless of the actors. In the 2005 talk, um, I noted a few things about the, the parties here. Um, there are some things that publishers do that librarians have not traditionally done. Not an exhaustive list, but uh, it's a list uh, with, does, that does not overlap a lot with traditional library activities. Now, there are people in this room who come from relatively venerable library publishing operations and would be able to produce examples of some of these activities. Um, but by and large, these are things that have characterized the profession of publishing and the activity of publishing. Libraries have a separate set of things that they do um, that haven't overlapped much with things that university presses do. Um, some, of this, some of these activities have changed quite a bit in the last 10 or 15 years. Uh, we don't select in the same way that we used to in libraries, for example. We don't do as much original cataloging. Um, but these are still activities that are um, deeply embedded in the professional identity of librarians. So if we did work together deliberately, what could we do? Well, one thing we could do is that thing called for back in 2005 which is to educate and train librarians, cross-trained professionals in publishing and, and libraries. And the Library Publishing Coalition is involved in an effort uh, that's focused at the University of Illinois, Go Illinois. I should say Go Illini, excuse me, um, to uh, work with that iSchool to uh, develop such a a program, and I, I would very, I'd be very interested in seeing that. Uh, when I originally talked about this in 2005, I listed a whole bunch of courses then on the curriculum that would be directly applicable to the activity of publishing, and that I'm not going to bore you with that list, but it would be longer now uh, than it was before. And then we have a lot of uh, faculty, especially in the online LEAP program uh, at Illinois, who uh, come from uh, some different parts of the world of especially electronic publishing. So a lot of those pieces are in place and it's great to see uh, an effort afoot to actually pull them together under the heading of a certificate or a degree. Um, we have some problems that we might be able to address together. Uh, these are also problems You'll notice from the background that this is 2005. See, when we go back to 2005, it gets brown and old looking. Um, got it. So uh, there's no business model for preservation by publishers. Uh, this is a long story, actually. Um, publishers have been melting down plates forever. Uh, and you know, uh, they don't, uh, it's, it's just not their business to keep them around after they've outlived their usefulness for production. Um, there's no mission in libraries to work with authors. Some libraries 
have worked with faculty who are editing journals or doing other other things. Um, but it's not a, a, we're not used to working with authors as producers um, in the same way. Publishers aren't particularly trained in the organization and collection of information within certain boundaries and activities. They do this, but uh, it's a particular view of the activity. And librarians aren't trained in marketing, graphic design, or business. Again, in certain domains, they do things that look like that, but that's not really a core part of the business. Um, there are librarians out there, um, by and large, in 2005, and probably to a lesser extent, but still in the majority today, you would find them in commercial publishers. And <clears throat> I think university presses are in this game probably only if they're collaborating with their libraries, partly because this is a question of infrastructure and, uh, and who's capitalized to have it. Um, and the particular kind of infrastructure involved here is more likely to be found either in commercial publishing or in libraries than in university presses. Commercial publishers are capitalized for new ventures. Uh, they spend money developing products uh, in advance of uh, the market. And uh, that's good if you're a commercial publisher. <laughs> it's not so good if you're at university press and you're trying to compete at some level with people who are capitalized that way and can do new things. Um, we had, when I was at Illinois, uh, a stab at a conversation that didn't really develop the way that I had hoped it would. Some people in this room uh, were probably part of that conversation. It involved, at each of several campuses, the director of the university press, the dean of the iSchool, uh, the director of the library, and the provost. And the purpose of these conversations was to figure out if across a number of major uh, state universities, they were all CIC universities who had all these pieces, could we agree to capitalize uh, the development of new research services around data communities that we could identify. Um, it was a really interesting conversation. Uh, one of the interesting things that emerged in that conversation was that all of the parties at each of the universities had basically only local constituencies except for the presses. The presses were the only people in the room who worked with communities of scholars across universities where their communities were defined by discipline or an area of interest. Uh, you could think of it as list building, but it's also community building. Um, everybody, else, the, everybody else was focused on the campus constituency. Um, so these conversations eventually broke down partly because uh, I think the, the presses and the libraries couldn't quite figure out how they were gonna work together on this. Um, I still think uh, the notion of developing advanced research services for data communities in an academic setting is a very legitimate, interesting target for a group like this and is doable if we can figure out uh, our respective roles in that. So I'm going to, in the last part of this talk, uh, give you a few different examples of what I think are opportunities to get at some of this. These are all um, things that I'm involved in in one way or another, so I make no pretense of, uh, of disinterest. Um, but they're also things that I know reasonably well as a result of being involved. So uh, the first thing I'll talk about is the, the Hathi Trust Research Center. Um, this offers the opportunity uh, to develop data communities and serve data communities without lots of redundant in investments in infrastructure. There is so much data being pooled in the Hathi Trust, not just from the Google Books project or things that libraries themselves have digitized, maybe for the Internet Archive or other places, but even 
later we'll see in Knowledge Unlatched, um, there are multiple sources of material coming into uh, the Hathi Trust. And it represents in some real way uh, the contents of an ideal research university library. Uh, there's a lot to work with there. There's three billion pages plus uh, on all subjects in many languages, only about half in English. Um, there's just a, a ton of opportunity. And the fact that the basic infrastructure exists removes a huge barrier to innovation for this community. If we can figure out how to build services on top of that infrastructure, we only have to deal with the part that's really, you know, where, where we could produce value, not all the stuff that had to be done before that. Um, at Illinois, there's a grant from uh, Mellon uh, that's just started uh, and that is a kind of regranting operation to work with specific projects that are interested in uh, developing a uh, more clear understanding of the work set in the context of these huge collections. So if you're working with three billion pages, you're not working with three billion pages. <laughs> Nobody can work with three billion pages. So you're working with some subset of that uh, very large collection. And how do you cut through the massive stuff to get the subset that interests you? How do you manipulate that subset of data once you have it? How do you share results? How do you share your data, the, just the selected set with other people? Um, what happens uh, as the work set goes through its life cycle? And what are its parts? Are they different in different disciplines? Are they different in different languages? Um, how, do we, how do we understand this fundamental building block of scholarly work in the presence of big data? So I see the Hathi Trust Research Center as a laboratory for exploring new research needs and opportunities. I see it as a place where we will partner in some ways with commercial publishers as well. Um, probably commercial publishers who are already academically oriented, and I'm thinking of Gales and ProQuests and people like that. I think the incentive for them is that they already get people coming to them on a regular basis asking them for data sets. And they actually want to be helpful. So, uh, and they want to know what people are doing with these things because they're interested in understanding the behavior of their clients. So they generally try to provide these data sets, but they do so with no guarantee that they'll ever hear back about what happened, no guarantee that the agreement to destroy the data when the research is done will be upheld, and a fair amount of staff time spent manually assembling the data sets that are required. So I can see a business case for a commercial publisher to put its data in the Hathi Trust and uh, to ask the research center to be in charge of providing researchers with those data sets. And part of all of this is the rights management piece. We're very excited in the Hathi Trust Research Center right now to be working through the final stages of uh, a security review at Illinois and at Indiana uh, and with oversight from Michigan uh, that is a, a necessary step on the way to uh, our being able to provide people with computational access to the copyrighted material that's in the Hathi Trust. That's the 75% of material that you can't get at under any circumstance right now. So, but just managing those rights, like building the infrastructure, is a huge undertaking which could swamp any of our efforts to uh, build services on top of that. And to give you a sense, um, this is the Hathi Trust's matrix of rights. Um, and I hope it's kind of legible. Uh, it's okay if it's kind of illegible too, though. It's just like vaguely scary. It would be okay. But across the top is uh, the type of work, uh, whether it's searchable as bibliographic information and full text, whether it's viewable, whether you can download a full PDF, uh, and whether it's available to the data API, whether it can be printed on demand, whether it can be made available to people with print disabilities, and whether it has preservation uses. That's the top row. Down the left-hand column, uh, types of work, just for an example. One type is public domain worldwide. That's the least problematic stuff. 
Um, and it's probably maybe 10%. Um, public domain in the US, non-US works published between 1872 and 1923. Um, works that rights holders have opened access to in Hathi Trust, so where rights are known and the rights holder has made the work open access. Works that are in copyright or of undetermined status, that would include the difficult category of um, orphan works, which is the last category below. And then where, where do these conditions obtain? Is public domain worldwide searchable? Yes, worldwide. Is it viewable? Yes, worldwide. Uh, are works that are public domain in the US and non-US works published between 1872 and 1923 searchable? Yes, worldwide. Viewable when accessed from the United States. So all of these conditions you know, have different switches uh, depending on who's looking at them, what they're looking at. And there is an infrastructure for dealing with this and there's a way of identifying materials as belonging to these categories. That in itself is a huge um, boon to being able to do work without ending up in court. Or let's say ending up in court very often. Because Michigan's, Michigan's in court all the time. Um, but they seem to like it. Um, and, and they've been winning lately. So go Michigan. Um, this is the infrastructure that you don't want to have to build. Um, and like that last slide, it's not really meant to be legible. It's meant to be sort of vaguely scary. Um, this is... Uh, High performance computing uh, hooked up to uh, data stores that are uh, provided to the research center from the Hathi Trust and uh, various processes, authentication, <coughs> passing algorithms back and forth across firewalls, et cetera. Great stuff not to have to do. Um, and why would we do those things? Well, here are some of the actual interesting questions that we get uh, around workset creation as an example, since I've talked about that. These are things that people want to do with this data. And I see lots of opportunities here for us collectively. Can we identify all the works that deal with Francis Bacon? What musical scores are in the corpus? What works contain music notation? Which works have back of book indexes that I might analyze? How would I gather works by 16th century women, by 19th century men? Which works are fiction? Which are nonfiction? Which are essays, poetry? How would I gather works similar to those that I currently have in hand? Can I define different kinds of similarity? So we didn't make up those questions. Those are real questions that real researchers have. And you can sort of see an implied research program behind those questions. Um, they're all questions that, in principle, are answerable. Um, they're all questions that you can't answer right now with existing metadata. Um, even though, in, like in the MARC record, there's a place to identify genre, but we don't do that when we catalog things, so it's not in there. Um, the gender of the author, uh, likewise. Um, there's, there are interesting computational ways to deal with some of these problems, uh, there's all kinds of uh, things to be learned by trying to answer questions like this. And I think a combination of publishers who work with authors and libraries who support scholarly research is a good group to, to be working with some of these questions. Uh, my second example is the University Press of New England. And, and one of my reasons for uh, accepting the invitation to come here and talk to you is that I really see a strong opportunity here for library publishers in particular. Um, I understand that the focus in library publishing is and should be on open access and that uh, that implies electronic distribution for free. However, given that we know that people will pay for format. Why not 
offer people the chance to pay for what they can also get for free and see what they do. Um, why not work with a group like the University Press of New England, who has a large program of publishing services and affiliates, and say, these titles seem like they might have legs. Let's, you take them, make them into ebooks, get them up on Amazon, iTunes, all your distribution channels that you already work with, and let's see what happens. And while you're at it, if somebody wants print, make it available so they can print on demand. We think it'll be too expensive, but you know, we'll see, see what happens. Um, I think there's enough interest in format to potentially make certain kinds of open access sustainable in, in economic terms. Uh, if we don't sort of deliberately cut off that market. Um, this is what the University Press of New England is focusing on at the moment in terms of list building. They have both general interest and academic lists, um, and they have an interest in books for course adoption. Um, some of the topics here might chime with some things that you're considering doing uh, in your own library publishing operations. Uh, if so, there might be some advantage to having those titles available to be found where people are finding other titles on those subjects. Um, but these are really the UPNE uh, focuses in their work with uh, publishing affiliates. The topics are at the discretion of the affiliate and cover a very large range. The kinds of services that UPNE provides, manuscript editing and book design, project management, domestic and Asian print brokering, ebook production conversion, and national and international distribution to major channels, including Kindle, Nook, Nook, iBooks, and library ebook aggregators, financial management and business operations, metadata management, book marketing and publicity, book sales, order entry, customer service, warehousing and fulfillment, including print on demand coordination. As a library, those are a lot of things that I don't want to learn how to do. And I would be very happy not, not to have to do them, but I wouldn't mind um, having uh, print on demand in Asia or uh, international ebook distribution. That'd be great. And ebooks are kind of the heart of the matter here at the moment. Um, this is Doug Armato from, from that Against the Grain article. The ebook transition's been a major hurdle, but that is well underway. In some ways, the biggest challenge in the academic library market is that it hasn't transitioned to electronic fast enough, and presses are still running parallel print and digital systems for library products, which is costly. So from the library side, the, the ebook, uh, the advent of ebooks has been kind of uh, overwhelming and confusing. Uh, Brandeis is part of a ebook pilot project in the Boston Library Consortium where uh, we went to a bunch of publishers and got negotiated prices. No two publishers price their ebooks the same, incidentally. It's enough to make you pine for Amazon. Um, they, <laughs> no, I didn't mean that, I'm sorry. <laughs> Everybody will get up and leave now. Um, the, the pricing is all over the map. Uh, they, publishers will offer you terms like, you know, Four people can view it, and then the fifth person who looks at it, you buy, you, you've bought the book, but another publisher will have different terms. It's the overhead in just figuring out what you're buying in some of these ebook deals is kind of staggering. So if we could work together to make any of that easier, more rational, I don't think it's that libraries are not interested in, in ebooks. They, they're interested in what their patrons want, and increasingly people do want ebooks. Um, and they're interested in technological innovation. Libraries have always been interested in technological innovation. So they're not in some spiritual way averse to this, um, but it hasn't been easy to figure out uh, how to work with it. At the same time, I think Doug's absolutely right that running parallel systems is expensive. And if you don't have a system that seamlessly produces uh, multiple outputs from a single input, um, then 
it ups your cost of doing business. My third and final example is Knowledge Unlatched. Again, many people in the room here uh, participate in that and are aware of it. Um, I've been looking at things like this since I got to Brandeis. I spent some time talking to the Unglue It people. Uh, Unglue It is a kind of Kickstarter model for making titles open access. And it's great, but it totally doesn't work with library budgeting. Uh, it's great if you're an individual. Um, but libraries couldn't plan a budget around Unglue It to save their lives. Um, Knowledge Unlatched, on the other hand, uh, has really taken that problem and solved it in what I think is a very neat way. And it represents an interesting collaboration as well between libraries and publishers. So there's a group of libraries who select titles that are offered up uh, by publishers, and that selection get, is sold, is licensed as a bundle to participating libraries. And uh, once the publisher has earned back the title fee, which the publisher gets to set, it's not a uniform uh, fee, then the book becomes open access uh, with a Creative Commons license. So this is a way that libraries could see their subscription budget as buying books out of bondage. Um, and that's attractive. And you can budget it. Um, so the open access infrastructure for distribution is the European OAPEN and the Hathi Trust. So some of the problems that this addresses. With more titles and fewer sales, there's more risk per title for publishers. Uh, and if you contribute a book to Knowledge Unlatched as a publisher, you have basically zero risk. On, and, and in fact, you are likely to have, on average, uh, better uh, results with that book than with your other titles because you have a guaranteed source of income for it, which there are no guarantees in publishing, I think. There. Um, monograph sales being squeezed out of library budgets by journals. Libraries need to figure out uh, how to increase open access to monograph materials. And what we've been doing so far is providing funding for authors to pay page charges, which is okay in the sciences, but it does nothing really for you in the humanities and the social sciences. It's just not a model that, that works there. Um, some title fee examples from Knowledge Unlatched. If you have a $10,000 title fee and there are 250 libraries participating, the cost per title for the library is $40. $40 is not an unreasonable price to pay for a monograph. If you have 750 uh, at that $10,000 title fee, it's 13 bucks, and that's a deal. So somewhere, you know, these title fees are realistic, I think, just from looking at uh, things at the Brandeis University Press. These are in the realm of reality. And to think that uh, with a few hundred libraries participating, this could be sustainable year in, year out, and every year would produce more open access monographs in the humanities and the social sciences. This is a really encouraging thing. Um, and I applaud uh, Knowledge Unlatched for having uh, cut this particular Gordian knot. So some opportunities for the Library Publishing Coalition. Uh, one is engaging the digital humanities, going back to trying to publish the Rossetti Archive with the University of Michigan Press. Um, we still haven't really figured out how to publish uh, Born Digital Humanities Scholarship, and it's still out there. Um, the University Press at Virginia, uh, before I l left, I helped them start Rotunda, um, which is a pretty successful experiment in, in this kind of publishing, but there are not a lot of them, um, and there's plenty of room to, to do more in that area. Uh, supporting data communities, which I talked about before, I think that's a very real possibility right now and one that uh, we should jump on. Um, other people certainly will. The publishing and curation of gray literature, uh, a lot of important uh, scholarship and communication goes on in the form of conference proceedings. Um, I'm involved with uh, a 
the Alliance of Digital Humanities Organizations, which puts a great deal of care into the production of its conference proceedings every year, and it's a real, it's a publishing operation that they do uh, year in, year out, um, because they want to preserve that record. Um, publishing faculty edited journals, um, experimenting with some new business models, and promoting sustainable open access. Those are all things that I think are on the table that we could be doing together. And because I came out of an English PhD program in the 80s, I have to end with um, deconstructing some binary oppositions for you. Uh, libraries versus publishers. That one's breaking down, isn't it? Um, open access versus commercial. One of the things that I learned early on about uh, the University Press of New England that interested me in uh, knowing more about them was that they had done a simultaneous open access print on demand and ebook publication in, uh, in classics of all fields, and that it had been a success. Uh, the opposition of print versus electronic, problematic. Um, everything's electronic to begin with. Some things are electronic at the end. Some things are print in the middle. Um, I'd, you know, I don't think we should be slicing our world uh, according to, to those oppositions. Experimental versus traditional. Traditional is becoming increasingly experimental. Uh, you know, it's like, can we actually still do that? I don't know. Let's find out. Um, but I think the same, you know, it's in the nature of professional values and uh, professional behavior to embrace both of those things. We know why our traditions are what they are. We value the, some of the things that we do, um, not because they're traditional, uh, maybe in spite of the fact that they're traditional, but we value them because we understand uh, that they're important, and we shouldn't put them aside uh, because they have that label. Research versus publication. Much more of a continuum uh, now than it used to be. Uh, I think maybe it was always more of a continuum than it seemed, but a lot of that continuum was hidden from view. You know, people writing letters, to each other. Um, the kind of communication and development of ideas that takes place now on the way to publication is much more public. It's done in blogs. It's done in, uh, in various online forums. Uh, and the moment of publication is actually, it's an interesting problem. When, when did you publish that idea? Um, when it first came up in the blog entry? When it appeared in the ebook? Um, and last but not least, and this is, a, this is one that I think will be one of the more difficult ones to tackle, um, but uh, the opposition between vanity publishing and scholarship, where vanity publishing is defined as publishing at home, and scholarship is defined as publishing abroad. Um, that one we have to get around, we, and I don't know how we do that other than by addressing it head on. Uh, if you are at a university, that has a library publishing operation or a university press operation, publishing with your local publisher should not be a stigma. Um, it should assume the same level of peer review that characterizes whatever else is published through those channels. And we need to get past this in order to, um, for one thing, uh, bring a little bit more of the logic of local goods and the subsidies for local goods to bear on our publishing operations. So that's it. Those are all the ideas, and I'll see you again in 10 years. Meanwhile, um, Thank you so much, John. Um, we have time for a few questions. <laughs> um, we are, are getting a, a microphone set up, but for the, in the meantime, you'll have to just speak up if you can um, with your questions. Um, Okay, so we're off the record here. Yeah.